Unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Psalms 90 verse 12. The Bible says, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Somebody shout hallelujah. The Bible says, so teach us to number our days that we might apply our hearts unto wisdom. Praise God. And I told people one day that for me, this happened many, many years ago, at about the age of 19. I learned how to number days. Now, he did not say, listen, help us to number our days. He did not say, help us to number. He said, teach us. It's an instruction. It's a teaching. God teaches you. It's not obvious that you know how, but it's inevitable that you know. Praise God. It's unavoidable that you should know how to number your days. Because you will not open your heart to wisdom. You will not open your heart up to wisdom. You will not open your spirit to wisdom until your days on earth are numbered. Hallelujah. You will realize that a seeking of wisdom is unavoidable. Nobody will tell you to listen to a sermon. Nobody will tell you to come to church. Nobody will tell you to pray. Nobody will tell you to read. Nobody will tell you to invest in eternity. Nobody will tell you to yield yourself to the ministry of God. No, it will be inevitable. It will work even without you thinking. Somebody shout hallelujah. You will start speaking. Your spirit will start exuding wisdom. It will not be something you force yourself into. It will be something that will happen so natural with you because you have been taught how to number your days. Not everybody knows how to number their days. You understand what I'm saying? This is what I want to take time to explain to you and open your spirit up so you know how to number your days. This happened to me, like I said, many years ago. And when it happened, my ministry changed. My life changed. My Everything on me changed. I don't just live. I don't just serve. I don't just preach the gospel. I don't just minister to men. I know my course to the end of it. Somebody shout hallelujah. I just can't wake up and you hear, oh, apostle just died. No. I know when I'll be finished. Praise God. And I live to that pattern every day to make sure that I'm in the right and perfect will of God concerning my life. Praise God. I don't push myself beyond the rule of the measure to which I'm given by God to reach men. Because it's not about how many numbers come to my meetings. It's not about how much attention I get. I'm not fascinated by who thinks or sees whatever they see. No. For me, most importantly, is that the will of God will be fulfilled in my life. And that I would fulfill in your life what the Lord has ordained me to do in your life as your priest. That's all. That shall be enough. It shall suffice in this life. Hallelujah. Paul says that I am accountable of no man's blood for I have revealed the full counsel of God. You see, Paul's issue is not how many millions of people are watching him on television. Paul's issue is that he is accountable of every man's life as a blood, not just a number, the statistic. Are you hearing me? He says, wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from all the blood of men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. My responsibility is to give everything that he has given me as he has given it to me to make sure that I don't hold back what you must receive. Whether you are available for it or not, that's you to explain to God. At least if he holds me accountable, I am accountable of no man's blood for I've revealed all the counsel of God. If I come short in the counsel, I'm accountable of blood because the people who come to sit in my meeting but when I'm telling them these words, these things are aligning their lives, their future, their course, their expected end. The new covenant is a blood story. It's not just a luxury. 
It's not just a game. Salvation, the, the gospel, uh, the ministry of the New Testament dispensation is a blood issue. That's why when Jesus Christ was giving Holy Communion, he says, take this, my blood, for this is my blood in the New Covenant. This is my blood in the New Testament. This is my blood in the New Testament. You understand what I'm saying? And he tells them, you see, you should never forget this. You should never forget this. So, how do we number our days? How do you number your days? I'm going to teach you how. When he says teach us how, I'm going to teach you how. Because the Lord taught, taught me how. Praise God. Now, contrary to many myths about this numbering thing, of course, contrary to many myths, and false ideas about this numbering thing. If you read the Hebrew, where he says, teach us to number. The word number there is manau, right? Mau now. But it's spelled as M-A-N-A-H, right? Mau now is pronounced. It means to count, but not the counting of at this age I'll be this. The count, no, no. The deeper place of counting is reckoning. It, it's more of a place of appointing and preparing. Okay? It's more of a place of appointment and preparation. Mao now. Mao now. It's a place of appointing and preparation. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's a place of appointing and preparation. So teach us to appoint our days. Teach us to prepare our days. You understand what I'm saying? It's not just the number one, two, three, but it says teach us to prepare, to appoint, you see? To count, record, number, assign, to appoint or prepare. Teach us to prepare our days. Teach us to appoint our days. Somebody shout hallelujah. The word there, manau, meaning to prepare, and this is very interesting, the very word manau, right, which means to prepare, it's the very word used in Jonah. In Jonah chapter 4, verses 6, the wind, the God, and the worm. Uh, it says, the Lord prepared a God, okay, the word therefore prepared is manau, and made it to come over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the God. And the Bible says, and the Lord prepared, again it's manau, a worm, when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the God that it withered. And the Bible says, and it came to pass when the sun did arise, God prepared a vehement east wind, the word there again for, ve for prepared is manau, and the sun beat up the head of Jonah, and he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, better for me to die than to live. The word prepared there, he prepared a vehement wind, he prepared a God, he prepared a what? The sun, the wind. He, he prepared it. He prepared a worm. He pre pre the word there, in fact, now numbering is the same word prepare. Teach us to prepare our days. Teach us to appoint our days. It's not the passive abandoning Christian which looks back to say, What have you set for me in my life? And then they tell you everything you're going to be. And then after that, you start. So, okay, you told me at 40 I'll be this. You told me at 50 I'll be this. You told me at 60 I'll be this. Oh, now I've numbered my days. Unfortunately, that's what many people think it is, but that's not my now. My now is not God giving you a blueprint of your story. My now is Him teaching you how to prepare your story. <laughs> Somebody shout hallelujah. He is not teaching you the appointed days. No, he is teaching you how to appoint your days. What a liberty. What a freedom in the spirit. To know that you have the grace on your life to appoint your days. To prepare your days. You know what that means? It means that you have a say in your future. Oh! You have a say in your future. You can prepare your day. You can appoint your day. You can assign things in your future. You can speak things into your future right now. You can prepare your spirit. But it's not just the wishful thinking, like I said, to wake up and say, you know what, I think in future I'm going to buy drive this. I'm going to build that. No, he teaches you. There is a way you prepare. 
Tell your neighbor, there's a way you prepare. There's a way you prepare. Yes. There's a way you prepare. There's a way you prepare. He teaches you how there are principles, there are patterns spiritually that help you prepare your spirit, that help you align your days. It's not just the wishful think of a lustful mind. Oh, I'm lusting. Ah, I think I'm preparing this. Oh, you know, I want this. Uh, so I'm going to prepare myself for this because I simply want it. No, God does not dwell in such realms. He doesn't dwell in such realms of indifference. Where you just wake up and say, oh, I wish this. Oh, I think I'm preparing this next year. No, it's not just a matter of preparing. I'll tell you, there are many people who have prepared and not seen what they've prepared for. There are many people who have plans in their closets. They have plans and ideas of houses they were supposed to build. There are people who have already written proposals of programs and businesses they were supposed to do a couple of years ago. But these businesses are not there. They're not working. Yes, they prepared for exams, but they failed to get school fees or tuition. You understand what I'm saying? They prepared for a wedding and they left them. They prepared for that job and they told them, you know what, we've considered you, we're going to give you that job. They prepared themselves, woke up in the morning, dressed up, you know, did everything right. And then they told them, you know what, wait a bit, we'll call you next week. And next week has become seven years. They prepared for services. They prepared crusades and people didn't come. You understand what I'm saying? They prepared themselves and people didn't come. They did every way to prepare in the preparational understanding of men, but they did not see the consequent results of men that have prepared themselves. That's why the Bible tells you, you have to be taught how. Somebody said hallelujah. You have to be taught how. You see, God's challenge with humanity, huh? is how to help men know how to handle the liberty of the spirit. That's his challenge with humanity. How to handle freedom. How to handle liberty. The biggest challenge of humanity is not bondage. Like many people think or teach that, oh, you know, the biggest challenge of humanity is limitation and, 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 and bondage. Because if you think about it really, there is nothing you think that you're limited over and you're in bondage of that you cannot walk out of or that somebody has not walked out of before or that somebody has actually never seen. I can tell you for a fact that, for example, money, hmm? money is the easiest thing to get in this world. But it's the biggest problem for many people, yet it's the easiest thing to get in this world. But it's one of the biggest problems for many people in this room, yet it's the biggest. Because spiritually, money was ordained to be an, a submitted element. It was never meant to be a controlling element. You understand what I'm saying? It was never supposed to be a controlling element. It was supposed to be a submitted element to you. He tells you, money answereth. Oh, money answereth. Money answereth. You know, it's standing waiting for the command of a man who knows how. You understand what I'm saying? When the Bible says money answereth, it means it, it stands to respond to the person who knows how to talk to. Money does not command all. Money answers all. Hello. I said again, money does not command all or anybody. Money is not even supposed to direct you. Money is not supposed to control you. Money is not supposed to change. You see, the problem with many people, and, and I've understood this over time, it's how people view money, not according to how the Bible teaches it according to the mind of God in the Jewish setting. You understand? When the Bible says, for example, that it is God who gives us power, the Bible says, to make wealth. Right? That he, the Bible says, may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. 
When you tell that to a person who has understood Jewish culture, the mind from the Jewish culture, the understanding from the Jewish culture, you realize that many people have a very myopic view about why they need money. Very, very myopic and selfish view. You remember when he says in James, you ask and receive not because you want to consume it on your own lust. Many of you, your definition of wanting to access money is personal, last. I need money, so even me I can drive a car like everyone else. I need money, so even me I can, you know, hey, be healthy. You know poverty is a spirit, don't you? It is. Poverty is a spirit. Agreed. Okay? But why do you want money? Why do you need money? What's the essence of money in your life? Why is it coming in your pocket? Why? Why do you want it? That's why the more desperate some people are, the more they are willing to do many things to get money. And then God tells you, look, this thing becomes a God. And he tells you, choose between God and mammon whom you shall serve, for you cannot serve both. You'll hate one or despise the other. You'll honor one or dishonor the other or hate the other. It's, it's, it's a principle. When you honor money, you dishonor God. When you love money, you hate God. You can't love money and love God at the same time. It's not possible because these are two masters. Praise God. He says you will either hate one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. That's why if you examine your personal life in the priorities you've set, it is clear who you hate and who you love. In the priorities you've set, it is very clear who you hold to and who you despise. It's very clear. It's very clear. very clear. You have to get to a point where nothing gets in your way for God. Nothing. Even if it's a deal and it's coming at the time when you're supposed to be with God, it can wait. But God should not wait. God should not wait. But when you tell God, you know what, uh -uh. <laughs> dude, you understand. But this one won't. You understand, but money won't. Huh? 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 You will understand, but money will not. You see the trouble there? Hello? Do you understand what I'm saying? It answers it. Its responsibility is to answer you, to respond to you. But there are people who look at it like something they are struggling to get to, and they're answering a call to. Some of you, 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 you appear that you're answering to the call of money, wherever it takes you. You understand what I'm saying? Is where you go. But that's not how it's supposed to be so. It's not how it's supposed to be so. When you understand from the Jewish perspective of that responsibility, you will know there are about five reasons why God establishes this covenant. You understand what I'm saying? Otherwise, some people, the church will never grow beyond certain places. For example, one of them, I'll give you an example. One of them, is to help government, right? And so he says, you shall lend to nations, you know? Oh. And shall have no need of borrowing. The responsibility of the good, the responsibility of the good of the, any government system of the world under which a Christian is seated. You're the one supposed to be making the economy rich. You're the one supposed to be lending to the government of Uganda. You're not, you, the government of Uganda is not supposed to be the one you, you're appealing to, to serve a government. Eh? No. It's supposed to be the other way around. So why do you want money again? That I, I, I even may I drive a car. Whoa, way. Whoa, whoa. So you, your, your brain is still that myopic. You're still thinking on that level. Government, it's not supposed to, to have control over the economy of Christianity. No, Christianity is supposed to help the economy of government. That's how God has ordained us. So again, why do you want money? I suppose I'm tired of renting. Oh, okay. I pray for you that you get rent money. Oh, that you build a house of what? Two, three, four hundred million, six hundred? Okay. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> money is one of the easiest things to get in this world. But yet it's one of the most complicated. Because certain people don't know how. You're hearing me? 
There is a lot, and I'm going to say this, of things in this world. When I say world, some of you will never understand. But let me explain it for you. The Bible has two definitions that I want to introduce you to. You understand? Very interesting definitions. One is cosmos, which is the earth. Huh? Which in some versions of the Bible is also called the world. Okay? And it has another definition called aeon. Aeon. E-O-N. Which actually means which in some versions of the Bible also calls them world. But eon means ages. Ages. And the prevailing conditions in the age of the age. Okay? Don't forget that. God just doesn't create an age. He creates the prevailing conditions of that age. So the Bible says the God of this world has blinded them. The word their world is not us. The word there for world is ages. The God of these ages has blinded them. You, you understand what I'm saying? When we go into the creation story, Genesis chapter 1 verses 1, right? When you go to Genesis, you realize that there's a difference between the created world and the made world. Okay? There's a difference between what was created and what was made. And when you enter Genesis 2, there is even that which was formed. Go to Genesis chapter 1 verses 1. Now I want you to read this. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1. In the beginning, listen, God created the heaven and the earth. Are you hearing me? He created the heaven and the earth. He created. That's finished. There's a full stop there. Huh? Next verse. He said, And the earth was without form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord moved on the face of the waters. And the Bible says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now listen. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from darkness. And the Bible says, uh -huh, And God called the Light, day, and darkness he called night and evening and morning and were the first day. And the next verse says, And God said, listen, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Okay? From the waters. The waters from the waters. I'm going to explain. And he made the firmament, divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And so it was, okay? And the Bible says, And God called the firmament heaven and the evening and morning the second day. Now, you see, there's also another one created here which he called heaven. And it was a separation of firmament. And he speaks of water. He separated the water of the earth and the water... Of above, you understand? That's why when you read the Bible, there are things you see as glassy sea. Yeah? So there, there is water up there like there is water here. But again, he's not talking about the water of the atmosphere. Because also the atmosphere holds water. How many of you know that? From where rain comes. Yeah? Those clouds hold water from where rain comes. The earth holds water. But then there, oh, there's also another firmament in the heavens where there is waters also. You see? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, in, 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 in the first verse, he created heaven and earth. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you start to realize now, he brings another concept of the heavens. Psalms 148 verses 4. Psalms 148 verses 4. Praise him, listen, ye heavens of heavens and ye waters that be above the heavens. You see, so there are heavens of heavens. It's not what, this is why when Paul speaks of the first heaven, the, the, I went to the third heaven and I saw things which were not lawful to utter. You know, some people, when they look up, they say heaven. That, because for them, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? So you realize it's three-dimensional. It's three-dimensional. And that number three is deep when you go deep into it. You realize that it's, it's 
It's really the creative story for anything that dimensional. You understand? His Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. You remember when he was talking to Noah? How many levels was the ark? Three. The Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the outer court, the temple was three dimensional. You understand what I'm saying? So it goes deeper and deeper. Even in your basic science, metabolism, catabolism, and anabolism. By faith, Hebrews 11, 11. There's something deep there. Sarah received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child. The word there for conceived is katalabeo, right? That's the catabolism, right? Now, okay, let, okay, let's go to your science. Let's go to your high school science. They taught us that metabolism, these are, they used to call them what? Biomedical reactions of the body okay and metabolism is twofold catabolism destructive anabolism creative okay if we're in the catabolic we talk about the primary foundation of things that have to be broken before we get into the bigger picture, to find out the real, lawyers call it a deposition. Eh? That's a foundational, that place where, before people go to court, eh? they enter like a car office, eh? then they put someone on trial of sort, some of them, they record them, things like that. So, those of you who did biology, science, you remember very well, eh? that when a human sperm, a man's sperm, goes into a woman, her body, the woman's body, must have power huh, to break the sperm and get into the nucleus of that sperm such that it can connect with the DNA in the sperm and then connect it to its system to say that a woman has conceived. The sperm just doesn't go into the egg and that's it. No. Somehow scientifically, there's a process it takes to break down this small little sperm. You cannot see a sperm, can you? You can't. It, it has to be under a microscope. But however small they are in their millions, that car one thing, it gets into that thing and breaks it to get life out of it. So conception is not just something that some of you think it just happens straight. No, there's a science there. That's the, the catabolism of the thing, that it breaks down for the larger particle into smaller ones to get the life. You get it? And when it gets that life and it connects it to it, again now it starts building. That's the anabolic, right? It starts building. That's the, the, actually the, the, the deposition. It starts building it into the shape of what it will become a zygote and then the child. You see? So it gets the bigger particle, breaks it into the small to get life of it, and then build the right thing and make a bigger particle again. You see what I'm saying? So it's metabolism, catabolism, anabolism. But you get what I'm trying to say. Now, when the Bible says Sarah received strength to conceive seed. Now, remove sperm and put the word. I want to show you what it means to read the word of God. That's why it says you, it, you separate, you understand? You, you enter the word and dissect it. You, and you understand? Yes, it has been spoken, but what is the life in there? You go deep inside, you start cutting it, da, 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 da. And then after that, you connect it to your story. And then anabolism takes place. Anabolism. Actually, anabolism is a deposition, not catabol. Catabol is breaking. Yeah? Now, it starts to build, eh? it's that foundational building of a case, right? So it's, it's... Do you understand what I'm saying? And then somehow, the kid comes. So God tells you, that's how you respond to the word. You have to receive it, cut it, look for the life in it, connect it with your understanding and experience and life and story. Are you hearing me? Then start to build another thing out of the thing that you broke up. So it's almost as though before things are really built, they have to be broken. You want the oil, but you don't want to crush the coconut. <laughs> you, want to, you want the wine, but you don't want to grind the vine. 
How is that? How, how can you get it without breaking? It's not possible. That's a pretty simple process. Oh, I want the anointing. Oh, you just want somebody to say, fire. This is, oh. <laughs> you, you understand what I'm saying? You have to learn to enter the word of God. You have to learn to, you know, if you don't get it, go and listen to it until you get it. You understand? So, God's problem here, back to the point I say, is not... The challenges you go through it's how you will handle liberty and freedom when it comes he has to teach you how to handle free stuff but the problem is you're still at the angle where they look free or that if it comes as free you're going to abuse it you see in john chapter 15 verses 7 he says if you abide if you abide in me and my words abide in you he said you shall ask that what ye will ye will and it shall be done unto you what a powerful thing ye will i want you to cut a what to catabolic the word will what ye will Catabaleo, the word, what ye will. Cut it inside and understand what it means for what ye will. Now, look at it from the perspective of God, okay? He wants to use you to change the world. No doubt about that. A sudden glory will come upon you. No doubt about that. A sudden anointing will fall on your life. Regardless, I'll be a preacher, you'll be a businesswoman, you'll be a career person, whatever you are, the Lord has ordained you for whatever he has. But the end of it is that you'd be big, okay? But how will you handle it? How will you handle prayer when you can ask what ye will and get it? How will you handle it when you can ask anything? Will you handle for the things that satisfy your belly? Will you ask for the things that satisfy your personal selfish nature? Or will you really ask for the things that matter? Why shouldn't I, as God, deal with you to a place where you, you know how the wisdom behind asking says that when I give you the liberty and freedom, you're going to build a kingdom. Who has understood what I just said? So that by the time I give you access to these things, you know how to use them. Because they will destroy you if you don't know how to use them. That's the process of Christianity. That is why we teach you every Sunday, every Thursday in the conferences to prepare you, to teach you how to prepare for your days. Somebody shout hallelujah. It's a preparation process. It's like if they say they're going to take you to the moon, they'll take you through a process to tell you how the moon works. They put you through a process eh, to a simulation process. You know what they call a simulation? For example, they lock you up in a building or a room, a small little room, a metallic filled thing, and then they put the same atmosphere like it would feel like in the moon. Then they suspend you. Then they say, when you're in the moon, this is how you'll be like. They're teaching your body to get used, to, to simulate, such that by the time you go to the moon, it's not a foreign experience. It is something your body has gotten used to. Because that, that shock... Eh? How many of you have ever sat on donkeys or horses? Eh? If you ever sat on a donkey or horse, the first time you, you ask yourself, how am I even going to balance on this thing? Because there's a way that you feel like, how do even people sit on it? You understand? Your body starts simulating. It starts to adopt by some interesting mechanism you don't even know. Within a couple of minutes and hours, you're You're comfortable. On the same thing at first, you're like, you're going to fall off, you understand? You feel like you, you, you're in zero gravity. But over time, your body gets used. It's the same thing, that they have to train your body to get used, right? And then you start to get instructions on how to ride the horse, okay? How to, 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 to whatever. Because hmm? it's, it, it's a beast, they call them beasts of burden, eh? You know why they call them beasts of, beasts of burden? Because these are things that I've learned to carry. Eh? Now... For example, if you've ridden a horse, you'll be amazed that you don't direct 
a horse, you instruct the horse. You don't direct it. There's a difference. Hmm? When he starts to talk about faith and he's like, you see what the, the, the bits they put in a horse and then you, 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 he gives an example of the horse. Eh? You remember when he starts to say the bits in the horse or the tongue and then they start directing it and then it goes the direction it's supposed to go. You don't, you don't force it. Because of course they'll tell you, okay, pull this side, then it what? Goes, pull that side, then it goes. But then as you continue to synchronize with it, you start to realize that the best horse riders in the world are not people who have learned to pull. The best horse riders in the world are people who have learned to instruct. You get it? Because this beast, it doesn't know that you're telling it to go one direction. It goes wherever its brain tells it. And I want you to note this. It goes wherever. And when you understand this, it's amazing how the great message is so. Horses don't work on commands. If you command it, it will throw you. If you just command it, God is said, it will, it will kill you. It will just throw you off its back. Because you're a burden, you understand, remember. So, yeah, the, 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 the stone is heavy. The look, eh? you, you don't command a horse. You learn to talk to it. You just learn to talk to it through instruction. Not command, instruction. So you see somebody sitting on a horse, and it's going, but you don't know that sometimes even the the slightest instruction was just getting that little strap and just pulling it a little, maybe with even one finger like that. It was going this way. He didn't pull. No, he just a little. It's almost that you cannot see it when he's holding it, the straps. But amazingly, it's a little instruction. When, when you learn how to, to move with it, you just have to pull a little and it will understand, oh, they are telling me to walk this side. Pull it and command, you'll see. Get off my back. You understand? And, and people think that you can teach anybody anything by commanding them. You can't force. You, you can't. You just have to learn to instruct. Eh? Even when a man is overtaken by fault, what does the Bible tell us? Let you who are spiritual restore such a man in a spirit of meekness. Some versions use the word gentleness. You have to be gentle with people. You have to be gentle in restoration, more so for the bed. Because they will not understand you if you begin from, you're stupid, and that's what the Lord does. It kills, then you say, you, you, you are going to hell. You, going, you, you scream all you want, people won't listen. Because the hearts of men are moved by the slightest and smallest things. Almost insignificant, but they're the most powerful. That's what grace does to your heart. It brings meekness. It brings gentility. It brings peace to you. It brings love to you and tries to turn your course through love. When you tell a horse, I'm pulling a little, you're telling it, I care about you. And I'm with you in this way. We have the same agenda. When you pull it a lot, you're telling it, I'm not in your business. Do what I'm telling you. The beast will talk. <laughs> like it did to who? Balaam. Praise God. Anyway. My point was that, like we teach you how to drive, like you're simulated, like you used to do uh, tests before exams came, hmm? God wants to prepare you for this liberty. He wants to teach you how to prepare your days. You understand? He wants to teach you how to number your days. To the end that you have the power and grace over your life to determine how your day will be like. Not to simply fit into the agenda of what you think he has put for you. That's what people think numbering days is. Numbering days is not passive. Numbering days is the full participation of the mature in the things of the spirit. To know how their day should go. Because you see, when he gave you the word, he did not limit you on how you should use it. He only wanted to teach you how to use the primary, how to align yourself in the primary principles. Actually, to teach you how, not how far. He intends to teach you how far. I mean how to use it, not how far you want to use it. Okay? 
He intends to you, teach you how to ride the horse, not how far you want to ride it. He intends to teach you how to drive the car, but not how far you want to drive it and how fast. He intends to teach you how to build a house, but not when and how to build it. I mean, I mean how fast and how big you want it. You get my point? God, God has not said for you, he has ordained for you this life and then you'll die that way. No, there is no such thing when he tells you whatsoever you will. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask whatsoever you, whatsoever you will. I just want to teach you long enough to know how to drive the car. Then you choose which car and how far you want to drive and how fast. I just want to teach you how to build a house. You determine how big the house is going to be. I just want to teach you how to build ministry. You determine the size of it. I just want to teach you how to enter marriage. You determine how happy you want to be. But marriage is not a bed of roses. No, it's not a bed of roses. No, it's a bed of roses, petals, flowers, candy, ice cream. Of course it's more than that. It's better than that. But, oh, you know, it's not easy. Who told you it's not easy? You made it not easy. And it's not going to be easy for you in the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> Ministry is hard. It's going to be hard for you in Jesus' name. Business is tight in the name of Jesus. It's going to be hard for you. Tell somebody for me it's easy. Everything is easy. In the mighty name of Jesus. Say everything is easy. In the mighty name of Jesus. You, you understand? This is me what I think. And this is what I saw. The reason why I gave the example of the world. Because by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word. This same word shaped the ages. And that same word is in you. It shaped the eon. It determined the condition of that age. And you say you have the word of God in you. How can you not control the age? How can you not be relevant in your eon, in your age? How can you not create your own world in this crazy world? How can you not create the conditions and circumstances under which everything surrounding you should work in this world? If by the word, the worlds were framed. God got the same ingredients he used to shape the ages and their conditions and put it in your spirit. The word is nigh it is in thine mouth. That same word which we speak. The what? Whoa, 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 whoa! Receive it in the name of Jesus. Do you understand? Now, you have the ability to shape your world. Hallelujah. In my world, there is no sickness. I refuse sickness. In my world, there is no struggle. I refuse struggle. I'm not a third world citizen. Hallelujah. I'm a Zion kid. Praise God. I'm increasing. I'm going upward and upward only. This world is mine. Even to the highest degrees in the world, they will hear me. That's my eon. I've shaped it because the word of God has said whatsoever ye will, it shall be done. How can you suffer? I cannot be poor. Even if I try, even if I choose and I say, now let's live be. I just become richer. Hallelujah. Because I've shaped an eon that can't kill me. Hallelujah. I cannot die young. Praise God. Because I've created the ages and provided for the atmosphere for me to be alive. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. How can you have what created the world? And then you stay in a struggling world. No, separate us from the world. Separate cosmos from Eon. I might not change the color of that tree, but I can change the atmosphere I want around that tree. Hallelujah. I'm not interested in changing the climate of Uganda, but I'm interested in changing the things around Uganda. Even if it rains, I don't give a damn. Hallelujah. Because sometimes people need food. That's okay. If I want, I can stop it. But that's not important for me to stop rain or make it walk or make it fall. No. What's important for me is that I have course, free course to fulfill my purpose on earth with nothing hindering me. Who has understood what I just said? Create your world through the word of God. 
That's what it means to number your days. You realize you'll apply yourself to wisdom because every wisdom that comes to your spirit, it's a reminder of the ability that you carry. Hallelujah. It, it, it's a stirring up in your spirit of what you can do with the word of God. How can Uganda be like this when we are in it? We refuse. How can Africa be like this when I'm preaching this gospel? No. How can East Africa stay like this when I'm standing here? That's not possible. I don't care what happened before or what has happened in the government. The fact that I'm preaching this gospel in Uganda Give us a few days, give us a few months, give us a few weeks, something is going to change. And people will say, surely there are people that know how to arrest the world. Who am I talking to? Come on, get to your feet and start to say crazy things. Create, create. His word is in you, create. Create. Come on, say something. Create. Take a minute and just say the craziest things. And everything comes with the word. Say, so you say that I shall lead shall lead to nations, and I shall have no need of borrowing. That's my world. I live in a world where I lend to nations. I live in a world of divine health. I live in a world of increase. I live in a world of multiplication. I live in a world of peace. I live in a world of glory. I live in a world of overcoming. I live in a world of miracles. I live in a world of signs. I live in a world of wonders. For you say these signs and miracles shall follow them that believe. I live in a world of righteousness. For you say that the righteousness of God is imputed on all that believe. For I have believed in you, God. I believe in a world of multiplication. You say that none among them shall be barren, not even their cattle. I will have children. Male and female. Karaba Sobo Zikatala. Come on, create! Thank you, Jesus. Saralalalamandu. I want to decree upon your life in the mighty name of Jesus that whatever you have declared is done receive the abundance of grace receive the increase of grace receive the results for which you're proclaimed in the spirit i want to decree upon your life that it is done in the mighty name of jesus come on receive it thank you lord thank you Jesus. the message you have just heard was brought to you by Sonero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at sonerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.sonero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowship at UMA Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest.